chemicals of the late 1970s and is now the largest producer of the, in the world, biofuels still account for only 3 percent of total U.S. fuel consumption. In contrast, the potential of biofuel is great. The Department of Energy predicts that biofuels could displace 30 percent of current fuel consumption by 2030. To get from today's 3 percent to tomorrow's 30 percent is going to require smart policies that focus innovation, investment and infrastructure towards the next generation of biofuels. Realizing the potential of biofuels to significantly reduce our oil dependence and global warming pollution will require unlocking the energy in the parts of plants currently considered too tough to use, developing technologies to produce the so-called cellulosic ethanol and other advanced biofuels will open up an array of sources from which to produce alternatives to oil, everything from agricultural and municipal waste to native prairie grasses could power our vehicles in the next few years and decades. In the future, the corner gas station might advertise that they can put a tulip in your tank rather than a tire. By expanding the fuel possibilities, the next generation of biofuels will also expand the opportunity for all regions of the country to produce the fuels that meet their needs the best. Massachusetts once played a critical role in the U.S. energy supply. Back when Melville was writing uh, by whale oil lamps about Captain Ahab's pursuit of Moby Dick. With the deployment of technology now being developed in the state, Massachusetts could once again begin to meet its own fuel needs and help other parts of the country do the same. Despite the promise of biofuels, we can't let them become our white whale of energy policy. We can't relentlessly pursue them and lose sight of the larger goal to develop fuels that combat global warming, preserve clean air and water, and protect wildlife and human health. The 18th century whalers almost hunted their fuel source out of existence. We must learn from them as we literally grow the fuel of the 21st century. We have a chance to help develop a whole new industry that is good for people, their pocketbooks, and the planet. As we reconcile the Senate and House energy bills this fall, we have the opportunity to steal, steer the United States in a new energy direction. The Senate language would expand America's commitment to renewable fuels from 4.7 billion gallons required today to 36 billion gallons by 2022, more than half from new cellulosic and other advanced biofuels. This would save almost 1.6 million barrels of gasoline equivalent per day. Combine, combining this with an increase in fuel economy and the rest of the best of the House and Senate uh, legislation, Congress could send an energy bill to the President that has the potential by 2030 to save more than twice the amount of oil we currently import from the Persian Gulf, reduce U.S. global warming pollu pollution by up to 40 percent of what we must do to save the planet, and create over 1.5 million new jobs. Our witnesses today represent a broad spectrum of stakeholders in the biofuels industry, from innovators to producers to consumers. I look forward to their testimony and hearing from them how Congress can help guide the development of a fuel source that reduces our oil imports and the dangers of global warming. I would now like to recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would first like to start out by thanking you for today's hearing. I believe that any discussion of energy policy must include a thorough examination of current and future technologies, and today's hearing on biofuels should give my colleagues and me the opportunity to explore the future of transportation fuels. I urge the Chairman to schedule more hearings on technologies that can help address energy independence and global warming. By creating fuel from crops and other biological materials, biofuels hold great potentials to help wean the United States from its dependence upon foreign oil and to help reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. While biofuels do offer some answers to both of these problems, one question is whether biofuels offer the right answers. They could very well, but at this point, the questions biofuels raise outnumber the answers. For instance, how much does the Federal Government need to subsidize corn-based ethanol, which seems to offer slight improvement in CO2 emissions, but also seems to put more pressure on food prices, water supply and quality, and land use? 
or would it be better to make biofuels from soybeans, sugar cane, or switchgrass? In August, the Wall Street Journal reported the cultivation of a plant called Jatropha, a shrub found in India that can grow in almost any climate and can potentially produce biodiesel fuel at a cost cheaper than any of the other plants I have mentioned today. Is the Jatropha plant an answer? And what about the alternatives such as hydrogen fuel cells? This technology has the potential to propel cars and trucks without creating any carbon dioxide emissions. But is it better than the biofuels currently under development? And I don't know the answer to these questions, and I suspect the Congress doesn't either. This is another situation where I worry that instead of letting the markets decide which product or technology is best, the government will try to pick winners and losers. In July, this committee held a hearing on the plug-in gasoline electric hybrid car. At that time, I raised some questions, but said the free market should be free to figure this out on its own. Just yesterday, it appears that market forces are starting to produce the answer. While General Motors and Toyota intend to keep developing hybrid technology, executives from Renault, Nissan, and Honda said they see gasoline electric hybrid technology as flawed and will apparently invest in all electric car technology instead. Fortunately, these executives made the decision without having to ask us in Congress what we think or us in Congress telling them what to do. An undercurrent of today's hearing is that the federal government should increase its mandated use of biofuels through a re renewable fuel standard. Congress enacted such a standard in 2005, and witnesses today tell us that biofuel production has already exceeded the production requirements. Some will say that we need to raise the government's mandate even higher because the free market isn't responding. I am not so sure that it isn't. General Motors is aggressively advertising its fleet of flexible fuel vehicles. Both Chevron and British Petroleum are proudly highlighting their research on biofuels. The larger question is how we move from petroleum to alternative fuels without disrupting our economy. One way or another, the free market will give us an answer, and I will anxiously await the results. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to commend our panelists for coming here this morning as well. I want to talk a little bit differently on another subject matter, and I know that we're going to hear from, from you on the importance of biofuels and researching renewable energy. But I want to talk about what's happening right now in Southern California and the communities surrounding my district. Unfortunately, many people still don't believe that uh, climate change is affecting uh, states like California, where right now we have 20 fires that are out of control. The fires have burned well over 420,000 acres, destroyed more than 1,200 homes, and have forced evacuations of 1 million people who uh, right now we are seeing the most devastating effects of climate change in the history of the state of California. Residents, as we know right now, are being sheltered at Qualcomm Stadium in San Diego, a military installation, and at high schools. The California Guard and Marines are being deployed to help both help with the fires and provide security and assist in evacuations. Resources are also being volunteered by our friends south of the border from Mexico. And these fires are devastating families, our communities, our economy, and our state. And in June 2006, I just want to reiterate this, Science Journal researchers concluded that more than land use changes or forest management practices, the changing climate was the most important factor driving the increase in the average number of large wildfires in the western United States. Human activity has caused climate change, and only through human action can we mitigate and adapt these changes. Now more than ever, I believe that we must have the courage to take swift action to implement an energy policy that relies less on greenhouse gas emitting fuels and a mandatory emissions reduction policy that quickly brings down emission levels. And I hope that all my colleagues here on the dais uh, and from all regions of the United States will join me in supporting our communities in Southern California as we struggle to stop the spread of these wildfires and cope with the devastation that they are leaving in their wake. And I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting efforts to combat global warming before its dangerous impacts become irreversible and more communities will suffer. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady's time has expired, and we thank you for reminding us all of that 
here today. Gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, in the interest of getting to our witnesses' testimony, I will abbreviate my statement and ask unanimous consent to put my whole statement into the record. I want to begin by thanking you for holding this hearing on the importance of biofuels to both our environment and our economy. I strongly believe we need to reduce uh, our dependence on oil and diversify our sources of fuel, including our, uh, especially our transportation fuels. Uh, I would note, however, a, a cautionary concern. Uh, this Congress in the past mandated uh, MTBE without fully knowing the consequences of that additive. Uh, and as we all know, that it's caused uh, concern to uh, our environment in terms of the migrating of that fuel out of tanks and damage to the environment. Uh, it seems to me we should use that experience as a guide here. Learn as much as we can about alternative fuels. Learn as much as we can about ethanol. Encourage its use, but encourage the use of those kinds of fuels in a way that will spur innovation. Uh, I think the Congress is not particularly well suited to predict the scientific future uh, and to look into the future and to know uh, what, in fact, are the best fuels and what, in fact, uh, are the safest fuels and will cause the least environmental damage. But that is what this process is about, and I uh, applaud the chairman for holding the hearing. I do want to add uh, as a point that earlier this year in the markup of the energy bill, uh, along with my colleague, colleague Mr. Mellencon, I offered an amendment uh, to require the EPA uh, to both study higher concentrations of ethanol uh, to determine what effect they will have on safety, air quality, engine operability uh, uh, in vehicles. And I also required uh, uh, in the amendment, we also required in the amendment that the EPA take public comment and consider studies and review the impacts of higher blends of ethanol uh, before those are used. My amendment was not intended to be anti-ethanol. It was intended to en enable us to be fully informed before we proceed with the use of those uh, higher concentrations of ethanol. The uh, Australia version of the EPA uh, has found in its studies that mid-level ethanol blends uh, can cause problems in terms of in current engines. Obviously, hopefully, we can modify those. Uh, resulting in failure of exhaust components, engine damage, engine stalling, failure of engine cutoff switches, and fuel leaks and blockage of fuel lines. Uh, let me make it clear, I am not suggesting that we ought not move forward with both ethanol and other alternative fuels. What I am doing, what I am urging is that we do so in a caution and caution, cautious and thoughtful way uh, so that uh, we get input, we get science, we hear from experts like we have here before us today. The amendment was supported by, among others, the American Lung Association, Clean Air Watch, and, Natu and the Natural Resources Defense Council. So I look forward to our witnesses' testimony today. I look forward to encouraging as much as we possibly can alternative fuels uh, in a way which does uh, benefit both the economy and the environment of uh, the nation and the world. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you as well for holding this important hearing and for your leadership on this issue. Uh, as you and I think the rest of the members of this panel know, this is an issue about which uh, I'm quite passionate. I believe that a strong commitment to biofuels production and use in this country must be one of the linchpins of our national energy policy in the decades to come and helps provide uh, a significant part of the solution to global climate change. With that in mind, I'm especially pleased and appreciative that you have invited one of the most innovative biofuels entrepreneurs in the country here to testify before us today. Don Endries of Brookings, South Dakota is the founder of Verisun Energy, which has in a few short years since its creation grown to be one of the largest ethanol producers in the country. Don is one of my touchstone contacts on all matters pertaining to energy and biofuels, and I consider him one of the foremost experts in the country on biofuels issues. I think you will find his testimony's experience to go directly to some of the comments already made by other members of the panel as it relates to the importance of technological advancements, not only for corn ethanol, uh, but cellulosic ethanol, and the work that he and others in the industry are doing uh, to reach the goals that we have been advocating. I am very pleased he was able to attend the hearing today, commend his testimony to all of my colleagues. I think he will offer a description of the current market conditions which support the need for fostering the market further with a more aggressive renewable fuel standard. I also am pleased that there will be a biofuel vehicle demonstration following the hearing. 
I drive a Chevy Impala that runs on E85 and a Jeep Liberty that runs on biodiesel. So I'm pleased that other members uh, of Congress will get a chance to learn more about those vehicles today and the importance of the infrastructure uh, for distribution of biofuels and the production of flex fuel vehicles. So thank you again, Chairman Markey, for having the hearing. I thank all of our witnesses for the testimony this morning. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the General Lady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also thank you for holding the hearing today, and I thank our witnesses for being here with us today. I will submit my full statement for the record. I know we're all anxious to move on to what they have to, uh, to say, but just very briefly, we are all concerned about energy security. We're glad that there are entrepreneurs who are looking at, at the issue and looking at the use of biofuels. Uh, we all understand the nature of um, biofuels from which they are derived. We uh, also know that there are some inventive processes, like Mr. Gardner's, that are taking place with some mixed usage. We're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that. Uh, we do have some concerns, water, land, availability, the cost, the impact that it has on food, uh, figuring out what works and what doesn't work, looking at waste products, seeing what is going to be economically and commercially viable are all issues that we will want to talk with you about, looking at the distribution and infrastructure systems of those, hearing a little bit more from you about that commercialization and distribution process is going to be of interest to us. We know that there is no silver bullet, but we appreciate the, um, the perspective that you bring to us. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back and look forward to the question and answer section. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your leadership and, and the vision you have for uh, the work of this committee. Uh, I will reserve uh, my time primarily for questions uh, uh, from these uh, experts who are before us. Uh, I, I do recognize that uh, biofuels are a part of the solution to the tailpipe uh, CO2s that are generating the greenhouse gases uh, that uh, help fuel the, the, uh, the fires uh, in uh, California. Uh, even though I, I recognize this, I operate on, uh, out of uh, no illusion. Uh, biofuels will not solve the uh, enormous challenges before us. Uh, but I do believe that we can and should maximize uh, the use of sustainable sources of domestic energy. And so I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from our, our panelists uh, and finding out from them uh, what the challenges uh, they face in producing uh, and developing biofuels. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to thank the witnesses for being here today. And I look forward to, your, to hearing what you have to say about this very important uh, biofuels. And uh, I yield back. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. I, I think this is a very important hearing. I appreciate the chair of having it. I've been traveling a lot the last couple of months talking about clean energy issues. And what strikes me is the people's uh, love of biofuels, which is also matched by their anxiety about what happens if we don't move forward in biofuels. And I think it's very important to share with the public the potential of the next several generations of biofuels so that we can continue this train on the tracks. So I appreciate this hearing and opportunity to do that. Thank you. Great. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with oil headed toward the astronomical height of $90 per barrel, skyrocketing gas prices and the home heating season rapidly coming upon us, it's clear that there could be no better time to have a serious discussion of biofuels. Um, in my own home, I'm burning the highest possible blend of biodiesel in my heating oil. Uh, in my district, there are several commercial and private producers of biofuels, and nationally, an aggressive investment in biofuels technologies could have tremendous results for our economy, our independence, our fight against global warming, and our sovereignty. I just heard in a briefing this morning by Lee Hamilton um, 
half of the leadership of the Baker Hamilton study, of course, um, about how our options uh, in terms of promoting democracy in Saudi Arabia are se severely, uh, severely and seriously limited by our uh, being held over barrel, literally a barrel of oil, uh, by the Saudis because uh, of our uh, current need for their product. Um, we should be doing more to increase the production of cellulosic biofuels and diesel, biodiesel at home, uh, providing more federal investment to help the existing production grow and financing research, research and development of new types of biofuels. Um, we need to make it easier for these fuels to come to market. I had a constituent call one of our offices uh, in New York, all excited because she had just bought a flex fuel vehicle and she wanted us to tell her where the nearest pump was, and we were sorry to tell her there are only two E85 pumps in New York State out of the 1,300 or so in the country. So even if you have a flex fuel car, the odds are you're not going to be able to get the benefit from it. Thirdly, we need to make it easier for the average consumer to use these products, which means making furnaces that can burn biofuels and more cars that can run on them more available and more affordable. Working toward these goals, we also need to be careful that we're truly getting the most out of our investment by making sure that we maximize our greenhouse gas reductions and pursue biofuels in a way that's consistent with responsible land use and does not adversely affect the cost of food or feed. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and yield back. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. All time for opening statements from members of the Select Committee has expired. We will now turn to our witnesses. And our first witness is Adam Gardner. Uh, even though uh, Adam now calls Portland, Maine home, he and his bandmates from Guster are indeed favorite sons of my home state of Massachusetts. They formed their band while at Tufts University and sold their CDs in Harvard Square. Today, Guster has sold over a million records and became, became, has become one of the nation's leading touring bands, playing sold-out shows from Radio City Music Hall to Farm Aid to the Boston Symphony Hall, where they perform with the famous Boston Pops. Four years ago, Adam and his wife Lauren decided to start Re Reverb, a nonprofit that educates fans and other musicians about environmental sustainability. They have greened 42 touring bands and, among many initiatives, encouraged touring musicians to switch to biodiesel bus travel. Uh, Mr. Gardner, uh, whenever you are ready, please begin. Check one, two. Is this on? Hello? Sorry, this is what we always do when we play gigs. Uh, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and ladies and gentlemen of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. It's truly an honor to be part of this dialogue on global warming. As a musician who spends most of his time either on the road in a tour bus or on stage in a t-shirt, I also want to thank you for the opportunity to wear this suit today to something other than a wedding or a funeral. My band Guster started touring 14 years ago from our home base in Boston. We started in a small van and eventually graduated to a tour bus and an 18-wheel truck for our equipment. We knew our tours consumed a lot of fuel. And you can only nickname your tour bus the Earth Eater for so long before making a change. We wanted our actions to match our beliefs, and I talked to a lot of other bands out there that felt the same way, but just didn't know where to begin. In response, my wife, Lauren Sullivan, who's been working in the environmental community as long as I've been playing in a rock band, decided to create Reverb, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating and engaging musicians and their fans to promote environmental sustainability. Over the past few years, we've worked with over 45 major national tours to implement a laundry list of greening efforts that reduce waste and carbon emissions backstage while simultaneously educating and activating concertgoers through a festival like Eco Village out front. Reverb also launched the Campus Consciousness Tour, now in its third year, to bring our unique environmental program to college campuses across the country, while adding daytime activities such as open town hall forums uh, with students, band members, environmental groups on campus, faculty and administrators to discuss sustainability on campus and what students can do to make a difference. To date, Reverb's efforts have reduced CO2 emissions by more than 25,000 tons, facilitated the use of over 250,000 gallons of biodiesel, involved more than 1,400 local and national environmental groups in the Reverb Eco Village, and reached more than 4.4 million concert goers face to face. Reverb is green tours for Dave Matthews Band, Nora Jones, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and many, many more. 
Reverb's biodiesel efforts seem to spark the most interest in conversation on the road with everyone, from, with everyone from truck drivers to record label executives. I suppose this is because biodiesel appeals to so many different stakeholders and has a wide array of possible uses and benefits. Biodiesel allows us to power vehicles while also protecting the environment, facilitate our independence from dangerous foreign oil dictatorships, and can support jobs in local and rural communities. The use of biodiesel is radically changing the music touring industry, and there's no reason why we couldn't continue to broaden its reach. Ideally, someday soon, our fans will drive to concerts in biodiesel cars of their own. Maybe even plug in hybrids, that would be cool. For Guster, making strides toward kicking our own oil addiction hasn't been easy. We had to leave our first bus company to find one that would allow us to put B20 in the tanks. At the time, there were only one or two such companies in existence. Finding biodiesel pumps on tour has been hard. With just 1,100 around the country, Reverb has to coordinate local suppliers to, to deliver fuel to bands on the road. But since we've started, we've seen biodiesel skeptics quickly convert to advocates. Drivers found that engines, in, sorry, drivers found that engines ran cleaner and cooler, and bus and truck companies have been responding to the increased demand from artists. While our nation has made great strides in biodiesel production, there are a number of ways we could continue to improve. The energy bill, the energy bills that the House and Senate passed this summer are a great start. Increasing production from renewable energy sources like sugar, wood, and algae while beefing up infrastructure, allowing consumers better access to biofuels at the, at the pump is a key component. I encourage you to keep this energy bill green, allowing Congress to take its first real step in the fight against global warming. Corporations can do more as well. I'd like to see auto companies encourage the use of biodiesel in higher blends, all the way up to pure B100, rather than holding the line at a 5% blend. I'd also hope that the agricultural community could come together. Guster was thrilled to play with Willie Nelson at Farm Aid, where we heard firsthand from small family farmers who want to be part of the solution. There I had the pleasure of meeting the founders of the Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance. The SBA is a nonprofit group whose mission is to promote sustainable biodiesel practices, from harvesting to production to distribution, keeping both environmental and social considerations to heart. It would be awfully ironic to go from reliance on irresponsible oil companies to a biofuels industry dominated by large-scale commercial farming at the expense of small farmers, community economics, and the environment. If done right, biodiesel offers the unique opportunity for a fuel product that is not just less bad than petroleum diesel, but is an actively good fuel that can reinvigorate our local economies and actually replenish and revive the environmental damage we've caused. On my path, I've encountered so many inspiring, motivated, and truly selfless individuals who are determined to create and propagate positive change. From pioneer artists like Neil Young and Bonnie Raitt, who have been circling the country using biodiesel for several years now, to the city of Milwaukee's Venu Gupta, who powers his entire municipal fleet with millions of gallons of biodiesel made right in Mr. Sensenbrenner's home state of Wisconsin. Most inspiring are the countless conversations held with the millions of music fans at the Reverb Eco Village. I invite you all to the next Reverb show so you can take part in this dialogue, where talk of global warming doesn't center around doom and gloom, but rather optimism, commitment, and creative solutions. It's a generation that stands ready to stare down the greatest challenge they will have to face, but they also look to you on your stage to lead the way. I see this moment in time, a relative flicker when considering the Earth's age, as a critical one. The growing wave of momentum to defeat global warming during this small window of opportunity could very well determine what life will look like on the other side of that flicker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gardner, very much. Uh, our next witness is uh, Don Andres, who is the CEO of Verisun Energy, the second largest ethanol producer in the United States, uh, 200 uh, and uh, uh, 50 gallons a year compared to uh, 200 ADMs, uh, one, uh, one, uh, you know, only no. ADM is beating you, uh, and growing. Uh, they have also developed a technique to produce biodiesel from distillers grains, one of the byproducts of corn ethanol. 
Verisun has plants in Ohio, Indianapolis, Minnesota, Iowa, Michigan, and uh, Mr. Andre's home state of South Dakota. Recently, Verisun and Enterprise Rent-A-Car announced that the two companies will work together to use Verisun E85 brand in Enterprise's flex fuel vehicles uh, wherever uh, uh, E85 is available. Uh, Mr. Andres, when you are ready, please begin your testimony. Good morning, thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for inviting uh, me to testify today on behalf of Verisun. I grew up on a farm uh, in South Dakota, and I'm pleased to be representing one of the nation's largest biofuels company, companies. We have four operating facilities uh, in production today. We have four more under construction and one uh, more facility under development. Once we're complete with these new facilities, Verisun will have an operating capacity of approximately a billion gallons per year. We believe uh, ethanol from cellulosic feedstocks will complement corn-based ethanol in meeting the growing demand for renewable fuels. Verisun has invested in Sun Ethanol, a Massachusetts-based uh, com company working to commercialize cellulosic ethanol production technology. The ethanol industry has grown significantly in recent years due to the demand from, mark from the market and in part because of the policies uh, put in place by the federal government. Today, approximately 50 percent of the nation's gasoline is blended with ethanol. Because of the growth of the ethanol industry, it appears now that there will be enough ethanol to blend 10 percent and 100 percent of the U.S. gasoline business. Clearly, the expansion of the ethanol industry is a success story. It is the most significant step this nation has taken to diversify our liquid transportation fuel since the advent of the automobile a century ago. But we're just beginning. Today, the industry is still too small. Our 7 billion gallons of current capacity makes up only 5 percent of the 140 billion gallon gasoline market. Now is the time to spring, springboard from the solid foundation of the ethanol industry to diversify both the feedstock used to produce renewable fuels and how they are used in our transportation fleet. If we are going to make game-changing steps towards energy independence, addressing global warming, and creating new economic opportunities, three very important items have to come together. First, enterprise must be empowered to work. Second, the Federal Government must lay the framework to enable the industry to succeed. And third, consumers must have both the access and the incentive to join our mission. Oil is now regularly breaking new record highs. This has caused a lot of players to jump into the race to find alternatives. In the past, their enthusiasm and investment <coughs> rose and fell with the cost of a barrel of oil. While this could happen again, I believe that world events have created a fundamental change. Walter Riston, the former chairman of Citibank, once famously said that capital go goes where capital is well treated. And the worst way to treat capital is to throw it into uncertain situations. It is critical now more than ever that we have federal support to help achieve ethanol's potential. Our first objective should be to look at every opportunity in Congress to achieve the certainty that vital investment capital is looking for, product demand. I experienced firsthand the importance of government policy when we took Verisa in public in 2006. It became very clear very quickly that people participating in the financial markets understood the importance of renewable fuels and they were excited about investing in something that could do so much good for, for our national security, our economy and our, and our environment. Their big questions were about policy. What role would the government play in promoting renewable fuels? Would the renewable fuel standard work as promised? The same questions about government policy that, placed, uh, that uh, faced Verisun in 2006 are facing those seeking investment in cellulosic technologies from the financial markets today. How much demand will there be for ethanol beyond 14 billion gallons of demand created through the E10 market? Will the Federal Government expand the RFS? How can E85 availability be jump-started? It's critical that the Federal Government act this year to pass an energy bill that begins to address these questions if we want to see continued growth of the ethanol industry. The ethanol industry is outpacing the current RFS schedule. Under the current law, the RFS mandates the use of 4.7 billion gallons of ethanol in 2007. And according to the Renewable Fuels Association, the ethanol industry is on pace to produce approximately 6.5 billion gallons of ethanol this year. 
Because of this, the RFS is not acting as a market driver at the present time. That being, being said, with ethanol selling at $1.55 per gallon and conventional gasoline selling at over $2 per gallon, ethanol clearly is lowering fuel cost at the pump. By blending ethanol and gasoline today, some refiners are passing considerable savings to consumers. Unfortunately, not all refiners are capitalizing on the economic advantages of blending ethanol. One of the most effective things Congress and the President can do in the short term is to enact an, an energy bill this year that increases the RFS. The Senate passed RFS calls for 8.5 billion gallons in 08, 10.5 in 09, and 12 billion gallons in 2010. These early increases are critical to fostering the continued development of the ethanol industry. Beyond addressing these near-term issues, the federal government should send a clear long-term message to the industry to support continued investment and growth. We support the Senate's call to expand the RFS to 36 billion gallons by 2022, including a significant call for ethanol production from cellulosic material. We believe this is a very achievable goal but one that will require widespread adoption of E5 usage. Without E5 demand, the market will not support the early stage development that is necessary to unlock the potential that Sadasic ethanol holds. As one of the largest biofuels producers, uh, we assumed a large responsibility to ensure a robust E5 market occurs. Today, only 1,350 stations of, of 180,000 uh, offer E5. We must do better. In early 05, Verison launched the, the nation's first branded E5, uh, E5 uh, product. We began uh, the program in May of 2005 with the conversion of 35 pumps in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. At the time, we launched a marketing program to raise awareness to the benefits of flex fuel vehicle ownership, E5 use, and enlisted the support of GM. E5 sales rose, demand for flex fuel vehicles increased, uh, and uh, consumers have been very pleased. In early 06, sorry. Today, Verison branded, uh, Verison has uh, a total of 110 retail locations around the country selling 85, including uh, one here right in the District of Columbia. From this experience, we've gained significant insight about what is necessary to develop 85 in the United States. As Verison works to expand the number of, of if stations. You, uh, if you could summarize, please, Mr. Sir, Andres. okay. I'd like to just conclude uh, by saying that, uh, you know, Ethanol today uh, represents a, a great early solution to the biofuels industry. It doesn't come clearly formed, uh, com complete in perfect form, but in fact we very much believe that ethanol today represents a great opportunity to reduce reliance on foreign oil, reduce greenhouse gases, and improve uh, rural economies for the country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andres, very much. Our second witness, Stephen Gatto, is the CEO of Bioenergy International, a company that has two 108 million gallon per year corn ethanol plants in Pennsylvania and Louisiana. Uh, they're also planning to build a smaller scale cellulosic pilot plants. Uh, Mr. Gatto, we're uh, very pleased to have you with us today. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today to uh, talk about a very important issue. I applaud your leadership uh, in recognizing the urgent need to change our energy paradigm. To the chairman in particular, uh, your leadership has inspired me over the last 15 years. When I would come to Washington uh, back in the late 90s to discuss ethanol, I was occasionally referred to as the village idiot. Uh, Gasoline was selling for about $1.30 a gallon, and no one had ever heard of the word of cellulose. Mr. Chairman, uh, you were one of the few uh, who listened uh, and inspired me to make a difference, and for that I'm profoundly th I profoundly thank you. Since then, I have uh, had the privilege of serving on the Biomass Technical Advisory Board under Presidents Clinton and President Bush. Uh, I've also worked with some congressional committees helping to create the Energy Policy Act, particularly the cellulose component. As the chairman knows, I came to this industry somewhat circuitously back in the late 80s. I have a cousin who's an avid environmentalist who took me to New Hampshire to talk about composting of municipal solid waste. And about the same time frame, I was introduced to a technology that had just gotten patent number 5 million. It was a little bug that uh, loved to eat all of the sugars from biomass. I figured it had to be a hell of a lot more profitable for us to make booze instead of making dirt. 
And as a result, I launched uh, what was one of the first cellulosic ethanol companies in the country. BC International, which later became Cellunol and is now Varinium, proved the technology was viable after developing and operating three successful pilot plants. We arranged financing for what would have been the first commercial cellulosic demonstration on sugarcane bagasse and rice hulls in Louisiana. 9-11, a change in administration, the deal fell apart, the industry set back a decade. Set back not because of a failure in technology, but because of lack of incentives and moreover, a lack of vision of what was to come. Today, with oil pushing $90 a barrel, the tragic loss of so many lives in the Middle East and hydrocarbons fueling the climate crisis, we cannot afford another decade of delay. My message is simple yet urgent. The ethanol industry is at a tipping point. We're on the brink of the next industrial revolution, on the verge of transforming our economy from a carbon-based society to a carbohydrate-based program with next generation biorefineries. I would suggest this is the year we either commit ourselves to an all-out offensive to reduce our dependency on foreign oil, to stop funding radical countries that continue to do us harm, and to reduce our insatiable use of fossil fuels to stem our climate crisis. I don't want to tell my grandchildren we failed because of lack of will. We need bold leadership to replace foreign oil with domestic production, first from corn, then cellulosic feedstocks, such as agricultural wastes and municipal waste. This effort is no different than the challenge issued in the 1960s by President Kennedy. He wanted to put a man on the moon. However, we did not attempt to do this all at once. We had a program sparked by vision, propelled by leadership, but grounded in phased yet ambitious milestones. We shot a rocket in the air, circled the Earth, flew around the moon, and finally landed on the moon. It changed history forever. We need that kind of vision and commitment from you all today. Let there be no doubt the energy bill this year is the fight of our generation. Clearly, with all the discussion of a glut, the biofuels industry has met the call to action and surpassed the current RFS for all the right reasons energy independence, global climate change, jobs, and American prosperity. The question and opportunity is, what do we need to do to provide America with a self-sustaining program that has an evolution with a beginning, middle, and an end? Homegrown fuels, initially from corn, then biomass, which is available from every region of this country. The Earth's ability to produce sugar from biomass is virtually unlimited. Story sounds too good to be true, but it's real and has already contributed to an economic boom in this country as other sectors such as housing lag. Today I serve as Chairman and CEO of Bioenergy International, a science and technology leader in the development of multi-product biorefineries that produce a wide range of biofuels and bio-based specialty chemicals. We just launched the first of its kind research facility in Woburn, Massachusetts, after spending the better part of the last two years assembling a world-renowned team and developing a strategic vision rooted in the integration of three specific initiatives. First was the creation of a secure cash flow stream from traditional corn plants. It pays the bills. It gets the business started. These are our cheap sugar platforms. Second is the use of bioenergy's novel biocatalysts to manufacture green chemicals and biopolymers from the very same cheap sugar. This diversifies revenue. And lastly is the integration of our cellulose technology, retrofitting existing and building future plants to drive down costs and move away from food-based raw materials. These three collective steps, we believe, are essential to ensure long-term financial success and continue to drive investment and interest in this sector. I believe we're very close to a day when a pound of sugar can replace a barrel of crude in the manufacture of everything from the fuel we put in our cars to the plastics and fabrics we use in our everyday lives. I'm especially proud of the ethanol industry and its extraordinary progress in the fight to reduce our nation's dependence on imported oil from phasing out Mr. MTBE. Mr. Gatter, if you could summarize, please. With an expanded RFS, we achieve energy independence, combat global warming, and provide American jobs and communities throughout the country. The bottom line is corn has and cellulose technology will change the game forever, and it will spur two to three trillion dollars in new investment. Today, we not only have the responsibility to transition away from fossil fuels with ethanol, we have the ability to do so. The immediate challenge for all of us here today is not to get bogged down in the incidental issues of first-generation corn plants, but to focus the real challenge to this committee and all of us to wean ourselves off the perils of oil as quickly as we can. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gatto, very much. And our next witness is Dr. Susan Lachine, who is a professor of microbiology at UMass Amherst and co-directs their Biofuels Research Institute. She is also the founder and chief scientist of a cellulosic ethanol company, Sun Ethanol. Uh, we welcome you, Doctor. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak today on the subject of biofuels and the impacts of biofuel development on energy independence and global warming. I am a professor of microbiology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a founder and chief scientist at Sun Ethanol, a new biofuels technology company headquartered in Amherst. I also serve as co-director of the Institute for Massachusetts Biofuels Research at UMass Amherst, which was established by an interdisciplinary team of scientists and engineers to develop cost-effective technologies for producing biofuels and other value-added materials from biomass. Our goal is to establish the scientific and technological basis to enable the U.S. to meet the Department of Energy 3030 goals, 30 percent gasoline reduction by 2030. The link between fossil fuel combustion and global warming is compelling. We urgently must begin to limit greenhouse gas emissions. The need to limit greenhouse gas emissions has become even more critical with recent results reported this week in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. First, that carbon dioxide emissions are growing at a much faster rate than anticipated. And secondly, the ability of the land and the oceans to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere has actually diminished. Clearly, as we look to the future in meeting our transportation fuel needs, we must limit the use of fossil fuels. The only form of energy that can contribute substantially to fulfilling transportation fuel requirements at costs competitive with fossil fuels is solar energy captured by photosynthesis in plants and stored in the form of biomass. At present, plant biomass is the only significant source of liquid transportation fuels that may replace the world's finite supply of oil. Ethanol derived from biomass is one of the most promising biofuels. In addition to reducing our dependence on imported oil, thereby improving domestic energy security and lowering the U.S. trade deficit, biomass ethanol production will also yield environmental benefits in the form of reduced greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, the increased value of agricultural crops, crops residues, new energy-specific crops will benefit rural economies through higher incomes and increased employment opportunities. Economic modeling studies suggest that simply integrating cellulosic biomass crops into the agricultural rotation ex um, existing could increase the net income of U.S. farmers by 32 percent, or $23 billion. In Massachusetts, where forest growth exceeds wood harvest, biomass from wood is a su sustainable resource. The total woody biomass supply in Massachusetts has been estimated to be 4.4 million tons per year, which could theoretically yield more than 400 million gallons of fuel ethanol. The relative benefits of biomass ethanol compared with fossil fuels have been passionately debated. Important questions arise concerning the energy return on investment. The ratio of ethanol energy output compared to non-renewable energy uh, input required to produce ethanol fuel. It is very important to note that several peer-reviewed studies have concluded that the energy return on investment for fuel ethanol production is favorable. Corn ethanol energy yields are favorable, and cellulosic ethanol energy yields have the potential to be even more favorable. Clearly, the production of ethanol from cellulosic biomass, such as wood chips, switchgrass, corn stover, and other agricultural waste, has a clear advantage over gasoline. In large part, this energy advantage arises from the fact that biomass ethanol production makes use of the whole plant, the usable fermentable components of plant, cellulose, which we now know what that means, and other polysaccharides are separated from the non-fermentable lignin component, which then can be burned and used as, power eth as fuel to power ethanol production facilities. It is very important to point out that the corn ethanol industry will play a central role in the future development of advanced biofuels in this, in this country. New technologies for cellulosic fuels are being built upon the pioneering expertise developed by the corn ethanol industry. 
Also, the industry has demonstrated that the agricultural sector of our country can play a key role on our path to energy independence. Cellulosic ethanol is a reality. Demonstration plants are in, full, in operation and full-scale commercial plants are in construction. At the same time, new technologies are being developed and must be developed for more efficient and more cost-effective conversion of biomass to ethanol biofuel, specifically to overcome the resilience of cellulosic biomass. Plants are tough things. <laughs> Plant biomass is composed of highly ordered sugar polymers such as cellulose. These plant components are shielded by a matrix of other complex plant polymers. The recalcitrance of cellulosic biomass to processing, for example, by enzymes, poses a significant obstacle to developing cost-competitive cellulosic ethanol technologies. Dr. Machine, if you could please uh, summarize. Yes. Um, I just want to conclude by saying that at Sun Ethanol, we are developing a strategy to overcome the recalcitrance of cellulose using a microbe actually discovered uh, in Massachusetts, a microbe from Massachusetts. And uh, we, we uh, hope that by using this technology, we will be able to bring down the cost of cellulosic ethanol production and make this a reality. In conclusion, okay. <laughs> Cost-effective cellulosic ethanol production is achievable in the near term. This will be a monumental task. It is essential that there be significant resources invested for research and development at both the applied and basic science levels. Such investments will have enormous positive impacts on the environment and the economy, especially benefiting rural economies. Given that biomass is a regional resource, the impacts will be broad and widespread across the country. Perhaps most importantly, it is essential that we begin to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Renewable and sustainable biofuel production must be a key component of our energy future. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, very much. And our final witness, uh, Nathaniel Green, is a senior energy policy specialist working on issues uh, uh, that uh, relate to uh, renewable energy for the NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Green. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, as been, was noted earlier, in the fight against global warming, there is no silver bullet. At best, there is silver buckshot. I believe that biofuels can be uh, an important contributor to the fight against global warming, one of those pieces of buckshot. But as the opening statements of all the members of the committee noted, uh, there's also the potential for biofuels to backfire, to make global warming worse, and to threaten our lands, forests, water, wildlife, and public health. New crops and technologies that are being developed today and moved from the lab to the marketplace, such as the technologies we've heard about from some of the other witnesses, will make it easier to produce a lot of biofuels with a smaller environmental footprint. But just because we can use those technologies in a more sustainable way doesn't mean that we will. I think it is a critical mistake to assume that technologies or feedstocks are a quick fix to the challenges of biofuels. Um, I think these new technologies are very promising, but just as it's a, a mistake to assume that they will fix our problems, it's a mistake to assume that the existing corn ethanol technologies are somehow inherently flawed just because they only provide marginal benefits. We can make corn technologies much better, and we can use advanced technologies in very um, unfortunate and flawed ways. To address this issue, we really need strong environmental safeguards and performance standards. It's time to shift our bioenergy policies um, and our global warming policies really away from a more is better strategy to a better is better strategy. This means moving away from a simple volume related standard and a flat per gallon tax credit to policies that reward performance. Congress should adopt a low carbon fuel standard as California is planning to do. A low carbon fuel standard rewards progressive reductions, requires re progressive reductions in the average greenhouse gas emissions from our transportation fuels. This approach rewards gallons of renewable fuels, electricity, hydrogen, any transportation fuel that can help reduce 
the average greenhouse gas emissions of transportation fuels. In the context of the current comprehensive energy bill that's being debated and reconciled between the House and the Senate, we should include an expanded renewable fuel standard, but we should make sure that it includes the environmental safeguard and performance standards that will move it towards this better is better approach. The industry is at a critical juncture at this point. As we've heard earlier, um, investors, university labs, entrepreneurs are all looking to see if the United States is committed to reducing our addiction to oil and starting to reduce our global warming emissions. We are at risk of losing a lot of the momentum that the industry has gained in the last few years, but we are also at risk of pushing the industry forward in the wrong direction. And that is why we need the environmental safeguards and performance standards to be built in to the renewable fuel standard. Um, my testimony goes into a fair amount of detail about the types of safeguards and standards that we would recommend, but as a high level, I would say we need to make sure that we're making a down payment on global warming reductions. This means setting a global warming emissions performance standard as a central part of the renewable fuel standard. We need to make sure that we are not going into critical sensitive habitats and lands held in public trust. We need to make sure that we are growing our new crops with the same best practices uh, that we require of our existing commodity crops. We need to make sure that we're protecting public health by setting rigorous um, air quality standards that require these new fuels um, that combust in different ways than our traditional petroleum-based fuels to be at least as clean at the tailpipe as our old fuels are. We need a labeling program to actually understand how these fuels are made, what, the, what their performance characteristics are, and then to link our incentives to those, uh, to those labels. It's very clear from your opening remarks that you're all aware of how complicated biofuels are. They're probably, in my opinion, the most complicated, uh, p important solution to global warming out there. But because of the urgency of global warming, we need to struggle through these challenges. And so I urge you to um, continue with these sort of hearings and really grapple with this problem because your leadership in this issue will be essential. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green, very much. Uh, that completes the time for opening statements from the witnesses. And the chair will now recognize himself for uh, a round of questions. Mr. Gardner, um, you are out there on an ongoing basis um, talking with uh, young people across the country. Can you give us a sense of what this green generation is uh, calling for Congress to do, for its government to do? Sure. Well, it's just been exciting to talk to all these folks. Uh, you know, when we came up with the idea for Reverb, I'm first and foremost a musician, and uh, we thought we would take advantage of the uh, relationship that bands have with their fans to spread environmental awareness. Uh, and it turned out to be a really positive side effect that it actually strengthened that relationship to be talking about these issues uh, to our fans. And the response has been enormous. It's been enthusiastic. Uh, I've learned about so many people, young people out there, working hard already, whether they're on campuses, working on biodiesel plants right there on campus, converting uh, waste vegetable oil from their dining halls to biodiesel in their science labs and running their uh, buildings and grounds vehicles on the stuff to uh, coordinating and rallying a large number of youth groups uh, across the country. I was just recently in Michigan uh, with uh, a rally. It was actually a campus climate challenge uh, a rally around environmental issues on campus. And just it was amazing to see the excitement and energy that young people have around these issues. They definitely want leadership. They're leading themselves, but they're certainly looking to all of you to help. Thank you, Mr. Gatto. Mr. Gatto, you've been through the ups and downs of the biofuels uh, uh, industry. Entrepreneurs always talk about this uh, valley of death <laughs> between the time of development of the technology and commercialization. What recommendations do you have for us in terms of congressional policies that we can put on the books that would help entrepreneurs to make it through that valley of death? Thank you. I, I think. Um, 
Um, that's a question that uh, has, has been most often asked, and I, I think there are three um, very important elements. One is market-based incentives that have the ability to pull uh, the use of the products that we intend to make. So in this particular case, uh, talking about uh, an expanded RFS specifically to cellulose versus uh, corn components is an important element here. Um, policy that effectively uh, opens the playing field to accept the products. I mean, let's, let's face it, in the case of cellulosic ethanol or corn ethanol, um, the oil guys <coughs> dictate what goes in the pump and what comes out of the pump. So I think it's very important to have an open playing field so that the products that we seek to make and put into the marketplace can be utilized. Uh, and then I think the third thing is to educate. Uh, what is a key imperative here, and we talk an awful lot about ethanol, but the reality is what these plants are all about are creating new biorefineries. Why? Because what they all have in common is they all make cheap sugar. And the very same science that is today being used to convert the sugars that come from cellulosic materials, the organisms that are needed to replace yeast. So if any of you have ever made beer or wine at home, you take your yeast, you add it with your hops, that's how you're making your ethanol. Here we create new organisms and they accomplish the same thing. Interestingly, however, we can take those very same fundamentals and apply them to all sorts of things like plastics, fabrics, uh, DuPont, for example, coming out with 1,3 uh, uh, propane diol from an organism now made at an ethanol plant, now producing textile fibers and products that can be used in everyday life. So, let me just ask a quick question of everyone along the panel, if I may. Um, in the legislation that passed in the Senate, there's a mandate of, of uh, 3 billion gallons of cellulosic fuel being produced by the year 2016. But there are no earlier deadlines in the legislation. There's no earlier timetables for 1 billion, 2 billion, heading up to 3 billion. Um, do you think there should be earlier targets uh, in any legislation which we pass for cellulosic so that we are more likely to hit the 3 billion gallon uh, goal by 2016, Mr. Andres? That's a very good point. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there's been a fair amount of discussion within our industry ab about that point. It's hard to project what the number will be, so, so it's uh, been difficult to uh, try to put a number down on a piece of paper. All, all of these projections are very hard to know, you know what's hit, what, what you can hit and what you can't hit, but clearly it would be helpful to, uh, to uh, consider potential to include cellulosic ethanol as it's produced. Uh, that, that might be a consideration. So as the product comes available, it's uh, required to be blended in the fuel stream. That would give investors some security that, in fact, uh, it would be needed in the fuel stream. I guess my question, but the question is, do you, do you think we need earlier targets? I think it's the, possible. The early signs are uh, uh, positive, and I think it would be very helpful okay, good. to increase. Let me uh, just quickly, center. yes or no, earlier targets, Mr. Gatto? Absolutely. Mr. Gardner? Yes. Ms. Doctor? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Green. Absolutely. Uh, I think it is important to note that the 3 billion gallon advanced biofuels target is not explicitly cellulosic. It's open to any technology. Basically, it's not cornstarch, which I think is a rather arbitrary definition. I think your interest in advancing cellulosic early is, is well put, but you need to understand it's a different fix than just bringing that number forward. Okay, thank you, Mr. Green. The chair recognized the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll start out by saying I'm not a real big fan of ethanol. Um, uh, most of the counties in my congressional district in the Milwaukee suburbs are under a reformulated gas mandate. Uh, a few of them are not. And the experience that we've had uh, is that if you use non-reformulated gas, meaning none with ethanol or gas with no ethanol in it, uh, the mileage goes up about 10 percent during the summer and about 15 percent during the winter. So that any fuel savings uh, uh, through the use of uh, reformulated gas ends up being eliminated as a result of the lower gas mileage and by burning more fuel to get to where you're going, my constituents end up putting more particulate pollution in the air. And the result of the market working is that there are a number of entrepreneurs that have 
put gas stations in right across the county line in the non-reformulated gas area. And they started going from four pumps and now a couple of them are up to 16 pumps because uh, again, the market is working even though there's not that much of a price differential. So it is a quality differential that causes my constituents to drive a few more miles to get filled outside there. Um, uh, you know, I think we're getting hooked, particularly on corn-based ethanol. And I would like to first ask Mr. Andreas and Mr. Gatto whether you favor uh, a repeal of the 54 cent a gallon uh, tariff that we put on sugar-based ethanol, which largely comes from Brazil, and if so, why, and if not, why not? Well, first, let me address the issue. Uh, no, nope, I've got five minutes. Please answer my question. Do you favor uh, no, the repeal? Re no, no. The reason the 54 cent tariff is in place is to protect the taxpayer. Uh, there's a blender credit in place to incent blenders to put ethanol okay. in the fuel. Mr. So Gatto? It's in shape. In place. No. Uh, again, I think, um, you know, there's a misnomer that all of a sudden Brazil is this panacea. Um, okay. The reality in Brazil is that Brazil operates six months a year, and during the grind season down there, they're consuming much of the product that they're manufacturing, mm -hmm. and that that is left available for export, they do find a way to either send it here or overseas. Okay. Now, my next question uh, addressed to both Mr. Andres and Mr. Gatto is, do you favor a repeal of the 54 cent a gallon subsidy that we apply at the wholesale level for ethanol production? Uh, it's 51 cents today. Okay. Uh, and no, I don't, uh, don't okay. favor it. It's an important market driver today. Uh, I do not as well. And again, this is yeah. one of the most important drivers to show that the United States has a commitment to the long-term success well, of this program. Um, let me just respond with this observation. Uh, when the government puts a protective tariff on and then grants a subsidy uh, over and above that, that might be nice when a market is starting out. Um, the ethanol market, I think, is now well matured. And uh, I get very, very fearful when I hear major ethanol producers saying we need both a continued subsidy and we need to have the protection that prevents sugar-based ethanol from coming into this country uh, without a rather large tariff applied on it. Uh, this is kind of double protectionism and the consumer ends up paying for uh, uh, that in the end. Now, you know, uh, I personally think that the subsidy that the taxpayers give to ethanol production is corporate welfare. You're a beneficiary of that corporate welfare. And the corn farmers uh, who end up selling a lot of corn to you folks uh, uh, end up uh, having a price advantage because of the tariff that we place on uh, the import uh, of uh, sugar-based ethanol in Brazil. Now, if this is such a panacea, why can't we let the market work without a protective tariff and without a taxpayer subsidy? And I have 37 seconds left, Mr. Andrews and Mr. Gatto. Yes, uh, uh, first of all, today the ethanol industry is not receiving uh, the blender's credit. The, the market is such that the oil companies are keeping that, which is, in fact, uh, helping create new markets. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, it is uh, an important element to open these new markets up. Uh, again, we, we don't receive the benefit of that today. Uh, the uh, long term, I believe, actually, you'll see that, that biofuels can be produced for less uh, than uh, gasoline, less than the ethanol, less than a barrel of gasoline, uh, than, a, than a gallon of gasoline. Yeah, but, but shouldn't we have been able to get to that point now with the tremendous emphasis on ethanol, uh, particularly in the non-attainment areas under the Clean Air Act with the reformulated gas mandates? Well, the biofuels development has increased uh, more rapidly yeah. than, the, than what the RFG markets uh, uh, need ethanol okay. to satisfy oh, the action okay. requirement. Okay, thank you. My time is up. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis, is recognized. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask all the panelists this question, if you could just each of you respond. Uh, we know that biofuel production spans the entire globe. Unlike fossil fuels, it seems as if every country can produce its own fuel through biofuels. However, 
I'd like to know from you, uh, is there a push to transition to biofuels and some, some of the concerns I want to raise. Is there a risk that the push to biofuels can create the same type of market problems associated with fossil fuels? That's one question. And if yes, how can we prevent this from occurring? And then two, how do we separate biofuels productions for fuels used from the agricultural market needed for foodstuffs and to combat hunger? And we'll start with Mr. Thank Andres. You. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a very good point. Uh, first of all, the ethanol industry is, uh, is continuing to fragment. Uh, there's uh, 131 ethanol biorefinery facilities running today, so it's a very fragmented market, very different than the oil industry that's consolidated over many years. And uh, so I think that's really great news. A lot of farmers have invested in the technology and the production facilities, so we, we see that fragmenting. On the food front, it's very interesting. The, uh, the, annual, the, the 25 year uh, food inflation rate is about 3%. The food inflation rate on uh, products either directly or indirectly derived from corn is only 3.4 percent from June of 05 to June of 07. So we've not, the data doesn't show increased food costs. As it relates to people starving in the world, uh, unfortunately we've had people starving in the world when we've had uh, grain rotting in bends. So I don't think that it's, it's, that's the issue. Uh, we think that in fact the additional protein that uh, the corn ethanol facilities produce will actually increase uh, livestock production, milk production, and it's a, there's a delayed effect. But in fact, we, we believe that there will be significant new, um, new protein available that will address uh, the food versus fuel issue. Mr. Gatto. I would have to agree with Don, and I would, I would just further that um, you know, what we're talking about also is a transition to next generation programs. And when you start to look at the impact of cellulosic ethanol, for example, you see a dramatic shift in terms of how these facilities are sited, where these facilities are sited. One could never imagine, for example, in Massachusetts, uh, building an ethanol plant that would be able to service the community there. Today, we can talk about whether it's wood waste, cranberry bogs, or a variety of other raw materials. Um, uh, uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner talks about uh, um, the fact that corn ethanol has had some issues with respect to Wisconsin. Interestingly, when we start looking at uh, uh, paper mills uh, and, and sawmill waste and logging opportunities that have been going on in this country and the jobs that have been lost as a function thereof, this is an opportunity for us to get back those jobs, to reinvest into those areas. And so we're talking about a broad proliferation of, of, of these facilities. So to the market issue, let's put this in perspective. If it's 20 billion gallons, which is associated with cellulosic ethanol, you know, the average ethanol plant today, uh, new plants are about 100 million gallons. Cellulosic ethanol plants will probably be in the 30 to 50 million gallons at the outset. So we're talking about some several thousand plants that would need to be built throughout the United States, not giving any one company necessarily the specific strength to dictate price terms or otherwise. I think it's important to emphasize the triple bottom line whenever we're talking about fuel production and sales, people, profit, and planet. And uh, some of the uh, principles that are outlined in my written testimonial from the Sustainable Biofuels Alliance, Biodiesel Alliance, actually outlines what we can be doing to avoid uh, the pitfalls of transferring our issues from petroleum oil to biofuels. Uh, and I do have to agree with, uh, you know, as far as food, having varied feedstocks is, is the way forward. You know, so it, what we're referring to as advanced biofuels is, is certainly, I think, the way forward and where we can end up uh, in, a, in a way that we're not putting anything in danger and only creating a positive. I agree with what's been said. Um, I just want to emphasize that this is, um, this is a very complex problem that will be solved through lots of different channels. And um, the um, biomass is a regional issue. Different regions will develop different strategies for converting biomass into a renewable fuel. Um, and as has been said, we're on a path, this is the path we're on to these advanced biofuels uh, where the issue of um, competition with food uh, will be solved. Um, I think the only thing I can really add to the excellent comments that have come so far is um, it's important to understand that as of today, there has been no market really for cellulose. 
So there's been no effort by farmers to figure out how to integrate the production of cellulose into the production of other food crops uh, or for the forest industry to, to think about how to produce um, cellulose for, for fuel either. So I think as the market develops, we'll see a, a, a potential for integration that uh, we can't, it's hard for us to imagine, which is why I think it's important to focus on the benefits. Thank you. lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank all the witnesses. I think this is very educational testimony and very helpful. Um, uh, I have all kinds of concerns and all kinds of questions. It seems to me, and maybe Mr. Anders, Mr. Gato, you can help me a little bit. Um, critics of corn-based ethanol uh, engage in a debate about whether or not the marginal energy gain is worth the effort. Um, I'd be interested in kind of two general questions. Uh, do you see cellulosic ethanol as having a greater spread between the energy consumed to produce it and the energy it produces? And if you do see that, do you see corn-based ethanol as a transition to cellulosic uh, ethanol? Yeah, there has been a lot of talk about it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's amazing that uh, even though uh, nine different groups have studied energy balance. Eight of the nine over the last 10 years have concluded that ethanol has a positive energy balance for all BTUs put in versus BTUs out. Yeah, I don't think anybody says it doesn't have. Yeah, okay. The question is, is it enough? Yeah, Go well ahead. Then, and it's look, cellulosic. My question is, is cellulosic yeah. better? Yes. The, the early returns of this, it looks as though, uh, because you can burn the lignin, there actually is a, a, a further extension of energy. But we get about uh, six times the energy out of ethanol uh, than what we put into it from a liquid fossil fuels perspective. So we're getting a 6x extension on our liquid fossil fuels by, by converting, by making ethanol. So I think it's something that's missed. It's a very good point. And I think cellulosic ethanol has a chance because you're burning the lignin to, uh, to increase the, to improve the energy balance. Mr. Gato? Well, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. In fact, the uh, Energy Policy Act of 2005, one of the key essential elements that you'll note was the opportunity to create an incentive uh, under the mandate of basically two and a half to one. And that was really an implication as to the environmental benefits that were provided as a function of cellulose compared to, say, traditional corn. So this was looked at, uh, in fact, a great, uh, a great amount of discussion and debate has really been had about the global warming implications, CO2 effects, and so forth. Um, cellulosic ethanol, first generation plants, obviously, uh, are going to have uh, issues, but I think, um, you know, overall what we're going to see is a transition over time, very much the same way that we've seen a transition in the corn side. If you look at ethanol plants that were built in the 1980s versus the ethanol plants today, we've seen a dramatic improvement. Just in the water consumption alone, for example, we've seen anywhere from five to six gallons of water per gallon of ethanol drop down now to new latest and greatest at one and a half. So all of these implications, I think, for both the transition from ethanol to uh, corn ethanol and then later to cellulose uh, are going to be fairly dramatic. My colleague, Ms. Lees, referred to the uh, tragic forest fire, for fires, I guess they're not just forest fires, fires burning in uh, California right now. Um, um, Mr. Gato, you talked about uh, the use of other feedstocks. In northern Arizona, we have a lot of forests and a lot of potential to use uh, forest undergrowth uh, as a feedstock, and we're trying to move forward with that right now. Um, uh, Dr. Lachine, I should uh, you ask answer that other question. The, the enzymes that you're working on and developing, uh, do you see those as being able to cre increase the essentially the, the margin of gain uh, in energy uh, over cellulosic for cellulosic ethanol over corn-based or sugar-based? Yes, actually, what we're working on is um, a microbial strategy where a microbe will make its own enzymes. And so what that does is it will eliminate the need for separately produced enzymes, which is, is one of the cost considerations in cellulosic ethanol. Um, so this is, this is one advance, we an example of one advance uh, we hope to see in the future, that just as the corn ethanol industry has uh, developed new technologies and new ways to improve efficiency and the, uh, the energy um, uh, gain. Um, in cellulosic ethanol, it's just in its infancy, and there are many technologies being considered, and yes, this is one. I'm running out of time. Let me, let me ask a, a quick question. I expressed concern earlier about Congress having mandated 
MTBE and having caused some damage by not being able to see far enough down the road. I am interested in any advice you can give to us on how we might foresee unanticipated consequences and avoid, you know, Congress doesn't move very quickly. Science, the science you work in actually moves quicker than we do. So that's one question uh, that I'd like to see you address. Uh, how can we avoid that, Mr. Green? Um, I mentioned earlier in my, in my uh, statement the idea of a low carbon fuel standard. And I think uh, the risk of picking a number of gallons is, as you're pointing out, that you, you pick the wrong number. And that's almost invariably it. If instead we focus on the amount of benefit that we want and then let the market figure out the cheapest, best way to get there, I think we'd get better results. Let me add one quick question to that, and then the chairman's going to jerk my chain. Um, should we be mandating a separate standard for cellulosic as opposed to other ethanol? I, I understand from the testimony the Senate bill doesn't say just cellulosic. Um, should we be separating those out? And anybody who wants to comment, I believe Mr. Gato, you wanted to speak to the last question. Yeah, if I could just add to um, one point you made and on, with respect to forest fires, it's very interesting because the state of California um, actually uh, had a, uh, the Quincy Library Group got together. It was yes. loggers, it was uh, uh, oil folks, it was uh, people in the cellulose community and really tried to focus on this issue and clearing out the underbrush and doing uh, an effective job at trying to manage what was really fueling these fires. So I point out that um, that is a key component to this and it represents yep. an extraordinary opportunity. Um, with respect to, um, you know, cellulosic ethanol and the differentiation between corn and or, or ethanol, I guess my view is ethanol is ethanol. What we want to do is create incentives. We want to drive the markets to next generation biorefineries by using the latest and greatest technologies. What we don't want to do is destroy the fundamentals of the ethanol industry. The, I guess my foundation would, would reside in the following way, and that is that if it's not ethanol, it's oil. And so today what we want to try and do is transition this to the most effective, cleanest, most, most uh, a diligent way of, of getting to, to the bottom line. One, one thing I would point out, MTBE, a blue ribbon panel, looked at the health impact studies of ethanol. Mr. Green, do you want to add a word here? Um, I'm sorry, actually. I have no. lost track. I was listening to the... Okay. No, the, the gentleman's time is expired. I appreciate the indulgence. Okay. The gentleman's time is expired. The uh, chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Hersai Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I first want to thank Dr. Uh, Leshine for her comments about corn ethanol being a central, playing a central role in the future development of biofuels in the country. And I want to state for the record my strong disagreement with the statement of the ranking member, Mr. Sessenbrenner, that the uh, tariff and the blender's credit uh, together constitute corporate welfare. I think it's unfortunate that when we are trying to promote um, protection for taxpayers, leveling a playing field and achieving important policy objectives related to energy independence, uh, that, that such a statement uh, would be uh, made from such a distinguished and long-serving member of the Congress, uh, particularly as it relates to um, uh, leveling a playing field and driving a market that's good for a number of policy objectives and taxpayers. Let me build on that and ask Mr. Endries, in your testimony you stated that ethanol is selling at $1.55 per gallon and conventional gasoline is selling at over $2 but that not all refiners are capitalizing on the economic advantages of ethanol blending. So if ethanol is so much cheaper than gasoline right now, why are some refiners still not maximizing their use of ethanol, in your opinion? Well, the, uh, the, the challenge is that refiners have a lot on their plate, quite honestly. Uh, we work closely with our customers and, in fact, they have a number of issues uh, reducing sulfur, trying to expand their facilities. They just have a, a lot of priorities on their plate. And so, uh, you know, that, that, that's why it's important, I, I believe, that we continue to, to, uh, to, to drive them to uh, integrate our product in their fuel stream. Uh, we're working uh, uh, diligently to, to work to help that happen as well, but uh, this would clearly set the stage. In fact, many times we've heard them say, just tell us what it is that that's a priority and, and we'll focus on it. And so I think that's it. And so a measure to um, drive them that way, given that we've had tax incentives, the blender's credit for a number of years before we had the renewable fuel standard of the Energy Policy Act of 2005, would you agree that not only do we need to have earlier targets for cellulosic ethanol, as Mr. Uh, Chairman Markey uh, was questioning earlier, but that we have more aggressive targets within the renewable fuel standard, particularly for the years 2008 to 2010? 
Yes. And Mr. Gatto, you'd agree with that? Absolutely. I think the most important thing for this committee to realize is that uh, uh, ethanol right now is at a transition point, and without a very aggressive campaign to expand the RFS in 2008 and through 2010, what you're going to see is the investment community absolutely run from this space. We've already seen it. Um, you know, we have had a record uh, pace with which we were building plants. Uh, we've now seen that over 50 percent of the new plants that were to be built have been put aside. We've seen certain banks in, in this space have now started to uh, take their teams that were focused on biofuels and move those teams into other areas of business. So it's an absolute imperative. Thank you. Also, for Mr. Andrews and Mr. Gatto, before I have a question for Mr. Green, um, the EPA has a current chart based on the percentage change of greenhouse gas emissions of a number of different uh, fuels. And right now, corn ethanol averages a 21.8 percent reduction compared to conventional gasoline. Now, just as you responded to Mr. Shattuck's question, Mr. Andrews, as to how technological advances have increased uh, the energy balance, the energy output uh, of ethanol uh, compared to earlier plants, uh, do you agree with the statement that technological advancements will also increase beyond 21.8 percent reduction as it relates to reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Absolutely. There's been uh, work uh, that's, that within the industry that shows, in fact, we could move that much closer, in fact, corn-based ethanol much closer to uh, cellulosic levels, uh, potentially a 50 percent reduction in fossil fuel use. So by integrating new uh, fuel systems, energy systems, actually potentially burning biomass uh, could help us get there. Thank you. And, Mr. Gatto, I'm going to cut you off just so I can move to Mr. Green, visit with you afterward, and you can take uh, that as a written question for the record. Um, Mr. Green, you state in your written testimony that, quote, on farms and in forests across the country and abroad, imprudent biomass harvesting would cause soil erosion, water pollution, and habitat destruction, while also substantially reducing the carbon sequestered on land, unquote. Now, much of the excitement about biomass that I hear of from where I am and other parts of the country centers around dense perennial grasses uh, that use very little water or fertilizer uh, and can be harvested year after year without cultivation. So if we can achieve this, um, it doesn't sound like the scenario that you're painting in your testimony. And so I'd like to know what exactly about the model of those types of perennial grasses would concern you. Um, I think the critical part of the sentence that you read is the imprudent part. Um, and the, the challenge I see is that even though the, there are models out there uh, that are very exciting with the mixed perennial uh, um, grasses and uh, crops, it, um, just because we have those models doesn't mean that we will use them. It's easy to envision switchgrass uh, becoming a monoculture, being uh, bred to have a lot of above ground biomass, much lower root structure. These are the pressures that the marketplace will put on uh, farmers and breeders um, unless we put uh, a reward out there for good management. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentle ladies, time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I live in a city uh, that suffers from uh, the nation's uh, failure in geography. Uh, I mean, people will ask me how is uh, Dorothy and Toto and in spite of the fact that I live in Missouri, uh, or you know, were you the mayor of Kansas? Uh, and uh, but the truth is, uh, Kansas City is the largest city in our state. Most people would probably say St. Louis, but, but it's, Kansas City is significantly larger. 322 square miles, it's a huge city, one of the largest cities geographically in the country. We have one E85 service station. It is in South Kansas City, so if you land at the airport, you are somewhere in the neighborhood of about 45 minutes away from an E85 service station. And so even if you have the desire to uh, purchase, uh, you know, if you buy a flex fuel vehicle and you want to get it, you know, there are not many people who are going to drive 45 minutes to get gasoline. What, is, what can we do to help move, uh, create more of these, these stations in, the, in our country, we, the, the chances are the only places you can find a, an E85 service station is near a GSA facility because they've been mandated to use uh, biofuels. 
And so that's why you would only have two in New York, because uh, it, it, it's based primarily on G GSA. What can we do? First, uh, we've been pretty vocal on this. Uh, Verisense worked for a long time with 85. Uh, we continue to see the expansion of it, but uh, it's still way too small. Uh, we believe that uh, the blender's credit worked for E10. It's clearly worked and that we think that there should be a blender's credit that's focused on E85 uh, to give, the again, the blenders a uh, clear signal that, in fact, uh, the product uh, will be available. And our challenge today with E85 is that it gets less mileage because the vehicles don't optimize for the octane in the vehicle, so we need to discount that fuel in order to uh, make it available, make it, make it uh, compelling for consumers. And so uh, one of the things that, again, we, we've advocated is uh, within the VTEC system uh, in, in providing for an E85 Blender's credit so that uh, it becomes affordable. And we think Blender's uh, would, would, uh, would roll it out uh, quite quickly. Anyone else? I, I would just point to the importance of setting a, a long-term trajectory and, and a, you know, a clear commitment from uh, our country to shifting away from using oil as a, as a primary transportation energy to using alternatives. That's that signal to the market, to the oil companies, to the oil, the gasoline stations, is going to be a critical play a critical role in their decisions to invest. You know, what will eventually be um, hundreds of billions of dollars over time uh, to a new infrastructure. But if, 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 if uh, Brazil uh, is deriving about 30 percent of their uh, fuel from uh, ethanol, and, and someone said, I'm not sure if it was a correct figure, that, that, that most of that or half of that is eaten up uh, during the production season. Um, then and we are we, we don't have the the, the, the uh, capacity here geographically in terms of the the, the acreage to produce the corn to to, to do thirty percent I don't think uh, isn't it going to be too difficult to to uh, push someone to invest in a, in a uh, an E eighty five service station realizing that at the optimum at the maximum level they're not going to be able to sell but ten uh, percent. Well, I, I would just say that the uh, that it is it is working to a certain extent because uh, companies like ours and other ethanol producers have provided the fuel at a value to, to, to make it work, and that in fact the uh, uh, we now see a number of new models coming out that are flex fuel. So it's a kind of a chicken and egg problem, uh, but we do believe that the autos uh, will come out and produce more efficient flex fuel vehicles. Uh, once they see the market is there for them and that, in fact, uh, the economics will significantly improve and therefore the blender's credit could be a short-term uh, kickstart to, to making this work. Uh, I, I, this is not a supply issue nor is it a price issue. Um, I think it's an issue of access and one where, um, you know, to the extent that the consumer had the opportunity to truly understand that if they went and bought that car, that Chevy Impala, for example, uh, and had a place to, to go and fill up, that they would do so more often. It's quite interesting if you uh, travel through Brazil and you look at the service stations down there, they have two signs. They have a, a sign talking about ethanol and the ethanol price, and they have the petroleum price. And down there, in fact, the amount of ethanol that's being consumed is well over 60 percent of the total consumption and expanding to 90 percent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. I very much appreciate all of your testimony because I just got done writing a book talking about the great potential benefit of biofuels, and I'm glad I wasn't totally wrong. So you've, you've sort of comforted me, I particularly like Mr. Gatto's reference to President Kennedy because we named our book Apollo's Fire after basically that whole concept. But I just want to ask you in that, in that vein, Aren't we just pathetically short of the real challenge here as to what we really need to do to get this going? I mean, last night I was talking to a group about this issue, and I was sort of bragging about all the great stuff we're doing, and this lady stood up and said, you guys are pathetic. You're doing one-tenth of what you really need to do to get this job done. And, you know, looking at what's going on in the, in the ecosystem right now, I sort of agree with you. Do you have any comments about what we really ought to be doing here? You know, we went from 3,000 planes in 1939 making in America to 30,000 in 1943, couldn't we really accelerate these numbers 
much more rapidly than we have. Anybody want to just comment on that? Absolutely, and the market uh, is gearing up for it, but there's clear question now on whether or not uh, there'll be a market for the product. So absolutely, uh, look, look, uh, the, the renewable fuel standard required about 4.7 billion gallons uh, be, be incorporated this year. Uh, at the time that that was being debated, a lot of discussion about how it just could not be done. There was no way it could be done. We're going to produce 6.5, the industry will produce 6.5 billion gallons this year. So uh, the capital is, is ready to flow in and willing to be put to work, but there's a clear question today uh, because uh, of, of concern over lack of demand for the product. And so is there, is there any reason we wouldn't statutorily codify this commitment to make 50 percent of cars at least flex fuel in the short in short order? Does that make sense? And in fact, the autos have, have made a commitment uh, to produce more than 50 percent of their vehicles uh, as flex fuel vehicles. So let me ask you about requirements for pumps. When I talked to folks in Brazil, they told me that, look, you'll, you'll never get this done unless you really have some requirement for people to put in pumps. Because as long as one entity has control of a fossil fuel base, and that's almost all they sell, they're not going to willingly work with you to get ethanol pumps in and biodiesel pumps in. Shouldn't we have some legal requirement for a percentage under certain circumstances to have biofuel pumps in for uh, distributors at certain sizes? Anyone want to take that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you've really hit the nail on the head. I mean, here again, you look at the ethanol industry. It has risen to the occasion. During the Blue Ribbon panel talking about phasing out of MTBE, the community at large was saying, well, can we create enough ethanol to really satisfy the need? We did that in two years. So the problem is not supply. The problem is not investment. The problem is that the investment community is unsure as to whether or not this truly is going to be something that is sustainable. And so you can make the product, you can make it available to the consumer at a price that is certainly far more competitive than gasoline in many instances. The problem is if you don't control the pump, you don't control what comes out. So I would say absolutely. It's an, it's an imperative that if we're talking about an expansive RFS, we also have to include the, the ability to put the cars on the road and create the opportunities for customers to be able to use the product. I've been fighting for this, so just to let you know, we will continue that effort. Mr. Gardner? I, I would just like to add that the demand is so clearly there, and I want to echo the sentiments that we've heard today, because Reverb, a large part of our work is actually helping bands fuel up because they can't find it at pumps. And I would love for you all to put us out of business, because I don't want to be spending time doing that. I would love every band to be able to find it at a Flying J or any truck stop and fuel up. Uh, we could be spending our time doing other things uh, in other areas. So absolutely, the demand's there. We can hardly keep up with it just within our little community. I, I would just say that uh, I agree that, that we need the infrastructure in place, but I'm much more a fan of an incentive-based approach to make this happen. Because if you mandate it, it's very difficult to, if you go if you mandate it in areas where there's no tank, no no ethanol uh, uh, in the market. So I would just uh, say, uh, absolutely agree. We, we need the infrastructure, but an incentive-based approach I think is a better way to do it. Because in those markets that have ethanol, they'll put the blending infrastructure in place. Mr. Green, I would just add that I think it's critical um, when we think about biofuels and their role and their potential that we think about it in the broader context of, of solving the big picture problem that I think um, you're talking about here, solving global warming. And I think the issues that are being debated right now around the energy bill, uh, improving vehicle fuel economy performance, uh, making our electric sector cleaner through use of renewable electricity. When you put a package together like that with biofuels, suddenly the potential for biofuels becomes much greater because if we're using less fuel and our, our economy is getting cleaner, then a given amount of biofuels are going to go a longer way to, uh, to cleaning up the atmosphere, doing their share, as it were. So I think the package approach that, that, that is being discussed is absolutely critical. Thank you. Can, Great. Jim, uh, yes. Um, I just would like to add. Um, actually completing, looking at the whole package and completing the, this package, that there still is room for new technologies. Uh, and actually, the development of new technologies will be essential. And so um, I think an important component will be support for basic research and, and development of these technologies, which will, will really be a driver for um, the next stage of biofuels. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Gentlemen's time has expired.
just might want to point out here that in Massachusetts we have 150,000 flex fuel vehicles right now driving around in one pump, which makes an awful long line at the gas station. So we definitely have to solve this problem as people are buying the vehicles and then have no place to go to get the fuel for it. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would just follow up on what you are saying by remarking that, that some might consider this a hoax perpetrated on the American people by the American automobile industry, which advertises that you are doing something green by buying a flex fuel vehicle when, in fact, you can't get the fuel in most parts of the country. Um, so with that in mind, I am curious, maybe starting with Mr. Green, what you would think of um, some way to uh, incentivize uh, the, the availability uh, in an infrastructure being put in by linking incentives for flex fuel vehicles to the number of pumps available in the state where the buyer lives, for instance? I think it is critical to think about the, the solving this problem it takes three parts, right? You need the fuel, you need the pumping stations, and you need the vehicles. And they need to come together somewhat simultaneously in time and space, because having a, a, you know, a fueling station over there or a vehicle over here or not having them all at the same time isn't going to do you any good. So you got to, I think, linking them together like that makes a lot of sense. And perhaps combining that with uh, an incentive for uh, the, the oil companies, and I say oil because, as was mentioned before, if that is their primary product, they don't really have that much incentive unless they are heavily invested in biofuels uh, to, to blend uh, uh, ethanol or other uh, biofuels in. Uh, once the profit of a given company exceeds a certain percentage in addition to the uh, uh, price of a raw barrel of oil, that it would be then considered to be excess profit and they could have a choice of paying it as an excess profit tax or investing it in pumps that provide uh, blended fuels. Uh, there must be some way of going at this from both ways so we can motivate the oil companies and also motivate the, uh, uh, the auto industry to be honest in their uh, promotion and advertising. Uh, thoughts from anybody else briefly on that? Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, I think that uh, you know, that is kind of a, uh, a stick approach versus a carrot and a stick. And, and we think that, uh, ag again, there is a, a lot of ethanol now uh, across the country. And all these new reformulated fuel markets, uh, ethanol is in place. So uh, we now need to take that, uh, that fuel and put it out uh, into E85 pumps, not just E10. But where you have E10, you can, you can, you can potentially have E85 pumps as well. It's just we need an incentive, a, a, a way for us to, to, in the short run, bridge this fuel economy difference. And I think you'd see a pretty dramatic rollout of 85. And, that, and realize, too, not all pumps, all stations, I should say, are owned by oil companies, by the large integrated oil companies. They're owned by a lot of independent people. And they're very willing to put these pumps in. But again, when we do the math with them, it's, uh, it becomes difficult. So. Again, I would just say I believe the incentive approach may, may get you there and do it in a, uh, in a more uh, uh, smooth fashion than trying to use some sort of a, a severe mandate. Thank you. I, I just would comment that uh, in, uh, because I only have a short bit of time, so I will make a comment and another question and then I will be out of time. But uh, uh, in Westchester County, which I represent, uh, the county buses uh, have been for the last couple of years hybrid buses, and our county executive just decided to switch them all over to biodiesel hybrid buses. And it seems to me when you start pyramiding one technology on top of the other, then when he turns them, I hope, into plug in hybrid biodiesel buses, you start getting the multiplication of these, uh, these different uh, new technologies to increase, well, I should say to decrease the amount of petrochemicals that we are burning. Uh, this I guess we'd go first to Dr. Lachine. Uh, uh, if you could tell us uh, how, for instance, in our, in my district and others around the country, farmland is constantly battling development pressure, and we're hoping that biofuel growth can play a, a role in keeping that land open. We don't have a lot of corn. We have a variety of other uh, crops that are grown, um, and at the same time, we're going to be growing. If we're going to be growing more fuel crops. We need a plan to make sure that our soil and water resources can support that. Uh, what kind of strategies should we be devising? What steps should Congress, EPA, USDA, and others take uh, to make that happen? Well, what um, 
we're talking about is diversifying the biomass sources of biomass, which can be utilized for cellulosic ethanol production. And um, there certainly is a great deal of work going on to do that in order to make, to, be, to, to develop technologies that will be able to make use of plants which can be grown in, in all regions. Um, so what this is going to require is working with uh, the, the agricultural community as well as the research community to develop the appropriate um, cultivation techniques and, and um, the proper crops that can grow in particular, in particular areas working together. Um, I think, there, I think we, we really do need to, to have more crosstalk on this to understand more about what crops are the most appropriate for a particular area. It, you know, we, we, we look at crops in terms of the um, production per acre, but that might not, the highest production per acre in some ideal place might not be the ideal crop for a particular area. And I think we need to have more integration between the agricultural community, the agricultural workers, and um, and the uh, research community that is developing these technologies for using particular biomass crops. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gatto, one thing that really excites me about biofuels is the potential for job creation, in, especially in rural America. Could you uh, go into that a little bit in terms of what kind of jobs do you think will be created, how that will impact the rural economy? I think uh, I just happened to, to, I have some numbers that I had asked for because uh, this is one of the things that I think is uh, often missed. Uh, national picture, current ethanol, 234,000 jobs. Household income has increased by over $40 billion. Domestic spending by $70 billion and reduced capital outflow to oil producing countries by $64 billion. On a yearly basis? On an annual basis, this is the impact of ethanol. Cellulosic ethanol has the opportunity to quadruple that because of the number of plants, and more importantly, we're talking about taking these facilities and moving them into communities very similar to your colleague in New York, where rather than focusing necessarily on switchgrass, we might be talking about taking the paper sludge from the area mills. We might be talking about taking the mixed waste paper that's coming from the municipal streams. So all of these become opportunistic and we start looking at what the origins of these feedstocks are and how they can complete the cycle. Thank you. Uh, I understand that uh, total biodiesel production is rather limited due to acreage and, and crop limitations and so on. Um, how, do, how do the limitations, uh, and, and I'm not sure who would be the best one to answer this question, how do the limitations uh, between biodiesel and bioethanol compare uh, um, in terms of the potential for, for growth? I, I'm not sure that there is, a, uh, is a, a differentiation necessarily. One of the interesting things, and maybe Don can speak to this, that is emerging is the opportunity to take uh, one of the byproducts that comes from an ethanol plant and actually convert that to extract biodiesel so that, again, the context here is when you look at an ethanol plant today, it's truly a biorefinery of the future. It's taking everything that comes in that front door and creating products that are renewable and sustainable in nature. So what comes out of an ethanol plant is something called DDGs, which is a high-protein cattle feed. That product also has the possibilities of being turned into biodiesel and then taking an even higher protein value product that you can put back into the marketplace. Mr. In fact, we have, we have uh, 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 tested that uh, process. Uh, we're, we're, uh, uh, we've actually converted our oil from, from the germ in, in corn into biodiesel, and in fact, we're building our first extraction facility, and we'll be rolling that out at other facilities. So the two go hand in hand. Ethanol only uses the starch in corn. The rest of the product, uh, protein, the oil, the fiber, is, move, move, is, a, is a byproduct. And so uh, we think that these facilities over time will significantly step in in the utilization of that corn kernel. And uh, so we think they'll go hand in hand and we can actually provide feedstock uh, to the biodiesel industry as well. Thank you. Mr. Green. I, I, would, I would say, however, that the total amount of available vegetable oil uh, and the crops that we know that produce vegetable oil around the world 
is substantially less than the amount of cellulose that we know is in the world. Um, and uh, the important thing to understand, though, is biodiesel is a process. Uh, it's a, a way of making, cha changing vegetable oil into a, a, a diesel-like alternative. Ethanol is a molecule. Both of these things are technologies. And what we need to do is step back, because there are other ways to make diesel alternatives from plant matter. And there are other molecules other than ethanol. A lot of people talk about butanol, but butanol is just one other molecule. There are a lot of molecules out there. We need to be careful as we encourage this sector and try to really bring it along quickly that we don't lock ourselves into one technology, one conversion pathway such as biodiesel, one molecule such as ethanol. Let's focus on the benefits that we want from the sector and let the marketplace figure out what the best technology mix will be. Could, could you uh, sort of segue from that into what sort of environmental considerations we need to take in terms of using large-scale agriculture for, for fuel? Well, I, I think biodiesel is, is a, a prime example of how uh, it can be both done in a wonderful way and in in very destructive way. Um, we've heard earlier about family farmers, small farmers, uh, or um, students using waste oil, uh, producing vegetable oil. These are great examples of uh, community-based agriculture, re reusing waste materials to make a transportation fuel. Um, on the other extreme, you have uh, palm oil um, being grown on rainforest land, lands that, where they burned off the rainforest, burned the peat soil. The greenhouse gas emissions from that conversion process outweigh any benefits you get from avoiding oil for um, hundreds of years. So the extremes here are, are are pretty stark, and we need to, um, again, focus on the benefits that we want and make sure that we're picking those and not trying to tell farmers how to grow their crops, um, but say, you have to produce a, a fuel with real greenhouse gas benefits, with real soil quality benefits, with real water quality benefits, and then let them go and figure out how to do that. Our farmers are incredibly resourceful, and if we let them loose, they'll do great things for us. Thank you. And I guess my time has expired, so I uh, yield back to the chair. I thank the uh, gentleman very much. Um, we have uh, a roll call, which is uh, about to be called out on the House floor, um, but we have a few more minutes before that would occur. Um, uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we have a lightning round of two minutes apiece for each one of the members who would like to ask another round of questions? We'll ask. We'll first recognize the gentlelady from South Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, perhaps, Mr. Gatto, you could take uh, 30 seconds to respond to my earlier question. And then, Mr. Green, if you could comment on uh, your testimony where bioenergy feedstocks must not be grown or extracted from public forest lands. We have a lot of slash piles in the Black Hills National Forest, and I just want you to clarify if those slash piles from thinning projects by the Forest Service or uh, that's the, from a timber contract sale wouldn't then be used under that policy. And then finally, Mr. Gardner, thank you. Governor Brian Schweitzer from Montana has commented in the past about the importance of making conservation cool. And I think that's uh, true for concerns about climate as well. And so your efforts, particularly among younger generations, I think will help us in our policy objectives propel the consumer demand in particular uh, for more environment, environmentally uh, friendly transportation fuels and electricity sector. I just wanted to, to thank you for that. But Mr. Gatto, if you could. Yes, so the, the, the question was relative to um, uh, corn ethanol uh, emissions at 21.8 percent over, over gasoline, and the question was, can it segue closer, I believe, to, uh, uh, to uh, what we're looking at in cellulose. Cellulose, uh, interestingly, EPA numbers uh, as well uh, target uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions by over 90.9 percent. Uh, but if you look at traditional corn plants today, they are, in fact, already reducing greenhouse gases by as much as 40 percent. Um, Mr. Uh, oh, Mr. Okay. Green has maybe five seconds yes, on that slash pile question. Uh, I, I think the uh, potential for uh, forest material off our public lands to support a robust cellulosic industry is very limited. I think it's critical that we thin around homes and uh, to save lives. Um, but uh, um, I don't think the forests are a, a public, our public forests are a major source of material for the cellulosic industry. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The gentleman from uh, Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, biofuels are already uh, heavily subsidized 
by the federal government in an attempt to encourage uh, their, their use. Uh, producers of, of biodiesel or uh, diesel blends uh, are uh, able to claim a $1, um, $1 tax credit. One, I'm sorry, one dollar per gallon tax credit. Uh, th that would seem to me to, to be a reasonably uh, um, subsidized uh, method of encouraging use. Is there anything else that that, that can be done to encourage uh, use? I mean, and 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 I guess maybe more importantly, is that one dollar per gallon subsidy uh, adequate? Uh, I believe the dollar gallon subsidy is very adequate. In fact, it's, it's working. What's happening in the marketplace now is vegetable oil values have improved. Uh, so it's actually uh, now uh, incenting uh, companies like ours to invest in technology to extract oil. Also, new uh, uh, gasification uh, technologies and catalysts to produce various oil blends uh, to, to be converted to green diesel and other, other types of fuels. So I think it's, it's been very impactful. It's, it's working. And in fact, you see technology developing as a result. Thank you. My time is up. Um, gentleman from Washington State. Thank you. I will just maybe ask Mr. Green and Mr. Gatto to address this issue of how a low carbon fuel standard would work. Mr. Green cautioned us not to choose a particular technology but do it based on performance. Perhaps both of you could tell us how that should or should not work. Sure. Um, uh, as you know, the idea of the low carbon fuel standard is to set a goal for the uh, transportation fuel industry and say, we want you to reduce the average greenhouse gas emissions from all the gallons of fuel you sell. California is targeting a 10 percent reduction by 2020. A gallon of fuel, uh, of renewable fuel uh, that comes into the marketplace then is evaluated by the industry for its ability to reduce that average. Um, a, a gallon of uh, old-fashioned, you know, ancient corn ethanol that produced very small uh, benefits uh, would be valued less than a modern uh, corn ethanol industry plant uh, and, and versus a cellulosic industry would be valued even higher because just because of the amount of greenhouse gas reductions each of those different gallons would provide. Um, so it gives the, it drives the market forward. It also allows competition among technologies, the different diesel alternative technologies we've heard about, ethanol, butanol, electricity, um, all the different technologies get to compete on the benefit they provide the marketplace. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, uh, from an industry perspective, I, I think the question is going to be, you know, what does this transition period look like? What's the percentage? What's the right number? Uh, but I think in general what it does do is it differentiates certain bad products uh, and really moves us uh, towards a better understanding of, of how we can take these uh, programs, whether it's ethanol going to butanol or higher alcohols, for example, uh, and actually making them more sustainable and, and certainly more environmentally beneficial. I mean, the key uh, that, that I would like to stress here is, you know, we're looking at corn today, which is a very, very good example of what we could do. Uh, it's a great improvement over where we're at today with oil. Cellulosic ethanol is an extraordinary improvement over that, and we have an opportunity to do more. Great. Thank you. Gentlemen, time has expired. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Gardner for his work and, uh, and say, as somebody who spent uh, many a night at a truck stop with my band and crew and drivers uh, getting some food in the middle of a trip, uh, there are opportunities for uh, conversations with truckers. And I wouldn't be surprised if they and uh, the Teamsters and trucking companies might be interested in, uh, in these possibilities and that be another way of getting at it. That getting the word out is a big part of the problem. I and mean, when I found out uh, that I could buy a biodiesel for my own home, it was just me finally going, hey, I think I'll call my fuel oil company. I picked up the uh, phone in Dover Plains, New York, and asked, and they said, sure, we got 20 percent soy blend we can send you know, send it on over. But most people don't know to ask. So, the more we spread the word as you're doing, uh, the more people will know to ask. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. Um, Mr. Gardner, maybe you'll, maybe you'll be a member of Congress someday, too. We have a veteran from Orleans who is up here, and who knows? Just not in my district, please, even though you are educated there. Um, the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you. I have a, a fairly uh, straightforward question. Uh, ethanol degradation of oil pipelines, uh, is there a uh, 
a way to mitigate that, or is that, what's the solution to that to that issue? Well, we've worked uh, a great amount with our customers. In fact, uh, we believe you will see now ethanol blended in pipelines. Remember, the, the issue with ethanol pipelines is more so around water. There's water that lays in those pipes and it picks up the water. That's been the principal challenge, not corrosion of the pipe. We pipe ethanol around a great deal. Uh, we pipe it within our plants. Uh, uh, you know, it's a product we drink, so it's not a. It's it's. Uh, there's a. Uh, there's just that's an over over uh, used uh, issue, uh, and we'll. We, in fact, we believe we'll see some companies now starting to pipe ethanol, in, in a regional method uh, in the near future. Thank you, gentlemen's time has expired. Um, we thank our witnesses very much. Um, uh, we are committed. Uh, to passing a bill with a, a strong renewable fuel standard in it. You have given us some of the other issues that we have to deal with as well. Uh, just obviously, the collateral environmental effects uh, that we will have to build in protections uh, and also the incentives to make sure that the pumps are out there so that uh, people who are buying these flex fuel vehicles uh, have a place uh, that they can then take advantage of this new fuel. So uh, your testimony has been extremely helpful to us in helping to propel us forward towards producing this legislation before the Congress adjourns this year. Uh, we thank you, and with that, this hearing is adjourned.